Boko Haram militants free scores of abducted Nigerian schoolgirls after a month in captivity. Uganda experiments with using insects for livestock feed. And robots break new ground in the construction industry. Africa 54 starts right now. Well, good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin tonight's broadcast in West Africa, where Nigeria's Minister of Information and Culture has confirmed the release of 91 of the 110 abducted students in the early hours of Wednesday. Al Haj Lai Mohammed told reporters in Abuja on Wednesday that the girls, along with one boy, who have released around 3 a.m. local time uh, through back channel efforts and with the help of some friends of the country. The girls are now back in Dapchi and are being documented according to the office of President Mohamed Buhari. The president's office says no ransoms were paid for their release. Local residents reported the militants drove the girls back to Dapchi in a group of nine vehicles, dropped them off and then left. The fate of the other remaining girls is not clear. Boko Haram kidnapped the girls from a Dapchi boarding school in February the 19th. One of the released girls described their ordeal. When they took us from the school, we were seated thinking about what we could eat. Then we heard a gunshot. Everybody was confused, running helter-skelter. They then called to us and asked us to come to the school gate. We went to the gate. They then called a member of the abducting group to bring a vehicle. They parked us into the car and asked who are the people fasting. They then gave us a malt drink, meat, water and groundnut cake. This was on the way after Dapchi. They then took us further under a tree and gave us food to cook. We cooked and ate and proceeded further. We continued going. We entered one river, then we boarded a canoe and crossed the river into a village. They took us away from that village in the night. We boarded another canoe to another place and remained in that place until today when they brought us back. We didn't go to any other places. They are giving us good food. They are not maltreating us. Between man and God, they were nice to us. When I'm, uh, for more on the release of the Dapshi girls, journalist Chika Udua joins me live via Skype from Dakar, Senegal. Good evening, Chika. Hi, good evening. Yes. Good to be here. Now, the, the big question here is how uh, were these girls released? What do we know about it that uh, perhaps uh, was missed uh, in the last time when the Ch Chibo girls were released, were, not, uh, were kidnapped, rather? Well, so far we know that negotiations were brokered between uh, the Nigerian government and this faction, this Boko Haram faction, which is said to be an ISIS affiliate. We know that there was no military force used because the president, Nigerian President Muhammad Buhari, says that he, he didn't think that military force would be a good option. I think that what happened here that didn't happen clearly uh, a few years ago in Chibok was that, number one, the president was quick to acknowledge that a kidnapping had taken place. In the case of Chibok, it took weeks before the Nigerian president at the time could actually admit that girls were kidnapped. Back then, there was so much speculation and suspicion around this. But in this case, uh, the president acknowledged it within a few days, and he directed his uh, defense forces, um, air team, to come and look for these girls. So I think just that leadership, it happened right away. And that didn't yeah. happen with the chip up girls. Now, you've spoken to some of the parents of these kids. Can you share with us their emotions? And what are they saying regarding the security of that area? They're overwhelmed. I think that they're overwhelmed with joy because just a few days ago, the parents of the Chibok girls had advised the Dapchi girls, the parents of the Dapchi girls, to be patient. So they were hearing, just be patient, be patient. We've been waiting, you know, for a long time. So this is what it's going to be like. It has become the status quo in Nigeria for for girls to be missing because many, many girls had been abducted by Boko Haram and many never returned. So the parents of the Dapchi girls had resorted to just waiting. So for this to happen so unexpectedly soon, really is just an overwhelming feeling that the parents are still grappling with and trying to make sure that this is real. They've been touching their daughters, according to what they told me, just to make sure this is real. So it's a beautiful feeling all around. While they feel that great, uh, uh, talk about 
the others uh, in that region, given that uh, it looks like Boko Haram can strike at any time, what do they feel about the government's ability to protect them and their children? They totally feel unprotected, the people of northeast Nigeria, which is why they were they are relying less on the government to protect them. Uh, the Dapchi school has been permanently closed by the government. So while this is good news for the parents of the Dapchi girls, this is bad news for education, because more parents are going to pull their daughters and their sons out of schools. Uh, so we have to wait to see what actually happens. Will schools be more secured? Because right now we're seeing that schools in northern Nigeria are not secured as properly as they should be. Real big challenge there. Chika, thank you very much for your excellent reporting. Thank you. Uh, that's a journalist uh, Chika Udua reporting for VOA from West Africa. Now, fighting in the Kasai province of the Democratic Republic of Congo has displaced more than one million people. The situation is just one facet of the crisis in the country. Well, the United Nations humanitarian chief warning this week that 13 million Congolese need aid, including 2 million children already experiencing severe acute malnutrition. Viewers Anita Powell has this report from the DRC. the smallest victims of a massive crisis in Congo's remote central Kasai province. Georgette is 14 months old, yet she weighs a mere 7 kilograms, far less than an average child her age. Medical workers say she is severely malnourished. Local militia clashed with government forces in Kasai province last year, turning Georgette and her family into refugees, far from their home and crops. We fled into the bush. She got sick. She couldn't eat. She had a cough. We were in the bush for six months. Georgette is but one of more than 50,000 children treated in the past year by the United Nations Children's Fund and other aid groups. UN agencies have asked for an unprecedented $1.7 billion for Congo, most of it for this region but they have received but a tiny fraction of that from donors. We estimate that 150,000 children were affected. So it's been very serious. A lot of people are still displaced. They cannot go back to their homes. They couldn't uh, go and do the planting season. They're hungry, they're in need, and they're desperate. Local health workers say they've never seen it so bad. The greater Kasai region, of three provinces the size of Germany, has never been well off. Even before the crisis, aid officials estimated that more than half of the children in this region were chronically malnourished. The conflict between an armed militia and the Congolese army, both of which are accused of committing heinous crimes, has pushed an already vulnerable population over the edge, locals say. If the international community brings us some support, it would make us happy and be a good help. At a WFP food distribution site in the village of Shikula, residents scrambled for meager rations of maize meal, beans, oil, and salt. The rations may save lives, but locals say they are still suffering. With students in a state of weakness, we are teaching them, but it's hard for them to follow. Even the teachers aren't in the mood to teach because they have empty stomachs. UNICEF warns that as many as 400,000 children under the age of five could die this year from acute malnutrition unless the agency gets the funds and the access to help. It's a difficult number to imagine, but for many of these mothers, those numbers mean little. What matters, they say, are nine-month-old Kabongo, 19-month-old Francois, 14-month-old Georgette, and countless, countless, countless others. Anita Pal viewing news. Kananga, Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, not too far from Congo, the African Union members meeting in Rwanda on Wednesday launched what could become the world's largest free trade zone. The trade bloc has been in negotiations since 2012 when the African Union first decided on a continent-wide plan. It aims to create a single market for goods and services, free movement of business and investments, and establish a customs union to regulate tariffs. The African Union aims to double intra-Africa trade by 2022, but the Kigali launch, while significant, is largely symbolic as many challenges remain before the trade deal can be implemented. Let alone become effective. African trade is dominated by the export of raw materials to Asia and the West and import of finished goods. The African Union says reducing barriers to trade within the continent will boost manufacturing and value-added products and services. 
Now, for more perspective on the Africa uh, free trade deal, Carmen Nibigira, a tourism uh, policy expert, joins me by phone from Kigali. Good evening, Ms. Nibigira. Uh, good evening. Yes, now, this looks like a really ambitious plan, this free trade across the continent. But people question, is it realistic to really create a unified market, a free trading area across 54 countries that have so many different challenges to face? Well, I don't think really it's a, it's a challenge. I think it's timely. This uh, continental free trade agreement is, is, is needed today. If you look at how uh, across Africa we are different, of course, we have 54 countries, but uh, the time to implement the continental free trade is today. And uh, we are a big population, or the youngest population on the continent of Africa comes from here. We are a population of 1.2 billion. Uh, I think we have uh, more opportunities and challenges we have, we can actually solve them together. Now, for a person like you who has actually been working in promoting tourism, uh, how do you make a case in a situation where there are countries you can't even visit because of security reasons, and yet you want to lump all these countries together, the DRC, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, all of them together? From a tourism standpoint, I think we, we sometimes look at the security in terms of what we, we see from outside. But across the borders, people are crossing the borders. You talk about Ethiopia, Somalia. Kenya is still a, a neighboring country where people cross for different reasons, whether it's for medical tourism, education purposes, and as well as trade. So we should not only focus in on the negative part of it, we also look at the opportunities. And all the hindering and the challenges we have seen are mainly based on the political will, and unfavorable political will has prevented us to achieve the potential of what Africa can do, actually. Now, Carmen, do you see the political will across the continent today to really uh, uh, kind of uh, realistically, realistically have the implementation of that kind of a deal? Well, we say Rome was not built in a day. Uh, of course, we have different regional blocks, whether you look at SADC, you look at East African community, you look at COMESA, and then on the western side of West Africa. What I mean by political will, we need to really move in incremental stages. Of course, the principle of all this continental free trade area is about understanding that even though our stories are singular, as partner states and communities across Africa, our destiny is shared and, and the success of what we'll do together is really uh, embedded in working together. So by, by design and by default, we are meant to work together. <laughs> well, once the ink dries on that deal, we'll continue the conversation. Ms. Nabigira, we thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Carmen Nabigira is a tourism expert, and she joined us from Kigali, Rwanda. Back here, the U.S. State Department has named 23 locations globally as among the worst regions for human trafficking. They include the Central African Republic, Burundi, the Congos, Eritrea, and Sudan. Sex trafficking is also on the rise in the United States. Fortunately, so are efforts at prevention and treatment. In the final episode of our three-part series, viewers Caroline Prisuti shows us some of the treatment programs and how those programs are making a difference on a global problem. Charlotte Ops 267 coming from uh, Orlando. Uh, we have an unusual situation with a passenger, a male and a female, in seats 10 D and E. This is a there. training scenario. Can you describe her to me? I think she's about 16. These air crews at the Charlotte, North Carolina International Airport are learning to recognize victims of sex trafficking. You live in Providence? Donna Hubbard, a flight attendant and a trafficking survivor, is one of the trainers. I'm looking to see if those children look like they are frightened, anxious, um, if they're traveling with someone who even looks like them. Airline Ambassadors International has trained more than 6,000 airline employees worldwide. 
But even after the victims are rescued, healing takes time. Some survivors move into residential programs, like Youth for Tomorrow in Virginia, where the fees top out at $12,000 per month. Here, trafficking survivors attend school, live with other troubled youth, and share their pain. My birth father died of a drug overdose and I lost track of my birth mother. The program teaches healthy relationships and how to recognize true love. And if the girls are okay with it, God's love. If someone's going through a really hard time, it's not unusual for um, one of the girls to say, you know, can we just pray for this right now? Last year, the program assisted 37 sex trafficking survivors. This is our dining room area. In downtown DC. Can you come in and see us tomorrow? Courtney's house uses Facebook Live I like your nails. to convince a sex trafficked girl or boy to visit this drop-in center. These survivors, mainly ages 11 to 15, were trafficked through Facebook Live, Instagram Live, and Snapchat. Founder Tina Front, a survivor, says her program often faces cultural challenges and stigmas. The mom thought that she would be cured if she comes one time. And I think that's also about not having trauma recovery in their home countries. Sex trafficking carries a stigma in this country too, says Bill Wolf of Epic Solutions, a trafficking prevention program. We're not talking about it in the schools. We're not talking about it around the dinner table. We're just not having that conversation. The International Labor Organization estimates that nearly 5 million people worldwide were victims of sex trafficking in 2016. Just Wolf says talking about it is the first step to stopping it. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up. Why insects could be the ideal livestock feed. Stay with us. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. Well, the world's last male northern white rhino died on Tuesday after age-related complications. Researchers say he stole the hearts of many with his dignity and strength. Northern white rhinos once roamed parts of Chad, Sudan, Uganda, Congo, and Central African Republic, and they were particularly vulnerable because of the armed conflicts that have swept the region over decades. Viewers Maria Madiallo has more. The 45-year-old rhino was euthanized after his condition rapidly deteriorated, said Stephen Gulu. Sunday morning, he completely was unable to wake up. His left hind foot uh, gave in completely. He was unable to support himself on it and he was not able now to rise. Earlier this month, as his condition worsened, rangers caring for him expressed sadness over his imminent death. I'm feeling so sad about him. I know him very well since I started working with him. He's a very gentle rhino. Two years ago, Zakaria Mutai, one of his keepers, told the Associated Press that because of human failure, animals like these might be extinct. People used to kill rhinos because of their horns. And many people have been uh, believing that uh, they use as medicine, but it doesn't cure anyone at all. So, but what we are doing is that uh, we are creating awareness to everyone. 
to see the importance of uh, conserving such kind of an animals. Named after his country of birth, Sudan was the world's last male northern rhino. In recent weeks, another rhino keeper who cared for him at the Czech Republic Zoo before he was transferred to Kenya in 2009 said he was special. None of my friends and I have ever dealt with any direct aggression or him trying to attack us. Usually, it was quite easy to interact with him. It was almost remarkable. And after decades of killing by poachers, the rhino had been part of an ambitious effort to save the subspecies from extinction with the help of two surviving females, Sudan's daughter Najin and his granddaughter Fatou. The only hope now lies in developing in vitro fertilization techniques. The death of Sudan actually shows that clearly, that if we don't take care of what we have, we will definitely continue to lose it and particularly lose other species that are currently endangered. Sudan was considered a celebrity attracting thousands of visitors. Last year he was listed as the most eligible bachelor in the world on the Tinder dating app in a fundraising effort. Maria Magyalu, VOA News. Well, the rising production of livestock feed, such as soy, gobbles up more and more valuable agricultural land that could be used to feed people. So farmers in Uganda are being encouraged to use insects as livestock feed, and some are turning the practice into a business. Here's viewer is Faith Lapidus. Makarere University offers a training program for farmers who want to learn how to breed insects for livestock feed. Instructor Joan Nakayemba says the process is simple and there's growing interest in insect breeding. She's led classes for five years for students who come from all over the country. Many have gone on to start their own insect breeding ventures to give farmers a cheaper alternative to feeds like fish meal. The purpose of this project is to replace or substitute fish meal. Because what fish meal is providing, that's protein, is what we are intending to be substituting, not maize blan. Maize blan will st still stay in the same portion because it, it, provides, it provides something else, which is energy, carbohydrates, and calcium, what, what will still stay in the same proportion. This fly, A single black soldier fly can lay between 500 and 1,500 eggs. After four to five days, the eggs will hatch into protein-rich larvae known as maggots, which will feed on the beds of decomposing organic waste. Just all flies, they will never let their eggs on bare ground. Mm, they have to lay somewhere. They, they are sure that the moment my young ones come out, it will have food to, it will have food to feed on. So that's the, the reason why I put these cardboards in, a, in rotting matter to entice this fly to come and lay eggs. Dead or live maggots can be fed to a variety of livestock, from chickens to pigs to fish. Um. Dr. Emma Naluyima is a graduate of Makarere's insect breeding training program. She feeds her catfish maggots and earthworms and says it's helped reduce her cost for animal feed by about three quarters. Our target weight for the fish is one kilo in six months. But surprisingly, when we feed the maggots and the earthworms to the fish, in four months, we have a kilo. So we've reduced our cost of production in terms of money and even in terms of time. So we reach market weight very early. In addition to providing a cheaper and more sustainable protein source for farmers, a UN report suggests insect breeding can benefit the poorest and most vulnerable members of society. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, robots break new ground in the construction industry. We'll be right back. In Nigeria, the government says Boko Haram has returned 91 students of the 110 they kidnapped last month. In Burkina Faso, the trial over the 2015 failed coup resumes after it came to a dramatic halt in February when defense lawyers staged a walkout.
In Egypt, as the presidential election approaches, Egyptian youth demands better living conditions while denouncing the country's lack of democratization. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, hunger plagues fleeing population in the war-torn region of Kasai. UNICEF says 400,000 children suffer from severe malnutrition. Finally, in Kenya, African conservationists call for more effort to protect wildlife following the death of the last northern white male rhino. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Three female students in Western India have invented a speaking glove for the speech impaired, which interprets hand signs and converts the message into speech through a mobile application. This glove can be used by the mute and converts gestures and signs into alphabet through a sensor-based software, which later is converted into speech. The innovators have also made an Android user-friendly application, which works in coordination with the glove. The aim is to bridge the gap between people with hearing and speech impairment and the rest of the world by giving them a convenient platform for communication. Well, next up, uh, robots are breaking new ground in the construction industry. Now, tech startups are developing self-driving bulldozers, survey drones and bricklaying robots to help the construction industry boost productivity and manage a shortage of skilled labor. The overall goal is to make construction faster, cheaper and safer. In addition to robots and uh, new autonomous drones, analysts say the construction industry needs more technological innovation to build affordable housing and fix aging infra infrastructure. The drones can survey an entire 90-acre site in 25 minutes, a job that used to be uh, to take a whole day with a truck-mounted laser system. Well, and finally, conservationists in Sweden have developed a high-frequency warning device in a bid to help save a vulnerable dolphin species. Hundreds of Franciscan dolphins are accidentally drawn in fishing nets every year, but it's hoped uh, the device might scare them away uh, from danger. Conservationists have developed a so-called banana pinger, a high-frequency transmitter that is attached to fishing nets and scares dolphins away. Finding the right frequency was challenging, so it's convincing fishermen to attach the high-tech device, uh, devices to their nets. Researchers plan to begin testing the pingers in the coming months, and that's what's trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Now, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show African News Tonight at 8 and the UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa uh, between 0600 and 0600 Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us in Washington. Have a good night. English in a minute. A lot of American English idioms refer to parts of the body. Get off on the wrong foot. Are Anna and Jonathan having trouble learning a dance? How did it go meeting your girlfriend's family? Well, it was uh, interesting. First, I was really late. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, and then at dinner, I spilled my water all over.